Welcome to the More to the Story podcast. I am so glad that you have come along. This is going to be a great show. I can't I can't help but admit that I'm a little nervous because one of the people I've read for a long time is with us, and I'm sure you've read him too. If not, you should. So I'll introduce him in just a second. But I want you to know this podcast, More to the Story, has more than 200 interviews and various shows that have been published over the last couple of years. We'd love for you to check it out, to subscribe to this YouTube channel, leave a review wherever you kind of download an audio podcast. We'd love for you to check that out. And it's brought to you by Wesley Biblical Seminary, where we are developing trusted leaders for faithful churches. And we have the highest enrollment in our history at this moment in a variety of ways to connect with us through bachelor's, master's, and doctoral programs. And we've just added this new course of study program for the Global Methodist Church. And we've had a couple of hundred people sign up in the last six months to be a part of that. So we'd love for you to learn more about Wesley Biblical Seminary at wbs.edu. And my friend Bill Roberts is also a sponsor of this podcast. He's a financial planner who helps people, particularly those people in ministry, think about their retirement. It's not something that we often do very well, but he has a great way of coming alongside people in a Christian way to help them think about that important task of retiring. So you can find out information about him at williamhroberts.com or there's a link in my show my show notes below. Also, there's a couple of things I want you to know that come to you from andymillerthird.com. I have this tool for preachers and teachers called Five Steps to Deeper Teaching and Preaching, and it walks you through an inductive exegetical process that helps you keep in mind your end audience, how you can communicate to people God's called you to serve. And that comes free to people who sign up for my email list at andymillerthird.com. I also have two kind of small group courses that are available for folks. One is a study of the book of Jude, those 25 verses that are incredibly powerful for our time. And then this the second study that just came out recently is a study of the afterlife called Heaven and Other Destinations, A Biblical Journey Beyond This World. And if you like N.T. Wright, I think you'll like a lot of the things I say in that series. So there's something you can use in, a, in various ways with small groups. It's a video-based content. We'd love for you to check out at andymillerthethird.com. Okay, the time is here. I am so honored to welcome into the podcast NT writer Tom Wright, who is a former Bishop of Durham. He is also a professor emeritus at St. Andrews. He's now at Wycliffe Hall at Oxford. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's very good to be with you. It's really a privilege to have you here. And I'm so thankful and excited about this new book. I'm going to put it on the screen coming out from Zondervan called Into the Heart of Romans, a deep dive into Paul's greatest letter. Now, it's interesting. You've you've done several. I've known you on several works through the years. You have a the new interpreter's commentary, kind of an exhaustive <laughs> look at Romans. You also have your small popular level um, New Testament for everyone. What led you to this place of wanting to write this book now? Well, um, obviously, Romans has been at the backbone of my um, academic and personal life uh, really, for the last 50 years, I did my doctorate on Romans in the 70s. Um, I've written several articles about different aspects of Romans. It's woven into my big book on Paul, Paul and the Faithfulness of God. And as you say, 20 years ago, I wrote that big commentary for the New Interpreter's Bible and the little one for the Everyone series. But that was 20 years ago. And a lot has changed in 20 years. Um, It's reminding me of when I wrote my book, Simply Jesus. And my wife said, what are you writing this book about? And I said, it's about Jesus. She said, haven't you written a book about Jesus before? I said, well, (laughs) actually, two, yes. And she said, so has Jesus? has changed and i said well <laughs> no but maybe i have um wow. and i don't th- i don't think i've well i have changed my view of some aspects of, of romans and romans 8 particularly and that comes out in the book but i think what's happened is my view of how the whole biblical story works from start to finish has has grown and expanded um, and taken on aspects which I really wasn't paying any attention to um, 20 or 30 years ago. And I mean, the, the obvious example here, which comes out in, in this book, is the whole theme of the temple, that uh, the, the the founding of the tabernacle in the wilderness and Solomon's temple, these are signs of God's claim on the whole creation. They're forward-looking signposts. And then in the New Testament, the temple theme devolves onto Jesus himself and then by the Spirit onto his followers. And so you can see when Paul talks about if the Spirit dwells within you, 
then the God who raised Jesus from the dead will dwell, will raise you from the dead. Um, th that idea of indwelling is a temple theme, which then follows through into the idea of glorification when the divine glory comes to dwell in the temple. And as far as Paul's concerned, part of the meaning of that, not the whole thing, part of the meaning of that is um, the, 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 the Christian and the church as the new temple, the mm. place where the living God comes to dwell. Now, these were not themes that I was working on 20 years ago, but they've become enormously important to me, not to knock everything else off their perch, as it were, but to fill them out and to show that, I mean, this is an incredibly rich and dense text. Um, uh, and so it's been very exciting. The, the, the book is basically only about Romans 8. Right. Um, somebody said, you're going to do the same with the whole of Romans. And I said, well, you figure this book is <laughs> whatever it is. It's 200 plus pages. Yeah. Just over 200 pages. So, okay, there's 16 chapters in Romans. So am I really going to write a book 3,200 pages long? Probably not. I, <laughs> I've written yeah. long books before. I, I don't want to do that again. Well, it's such a it's such a treat. I've heard you say this before and talking about these big themes through as in various ways that you've communicated through the years. And I think I remember one time where you said, if you really want to focus, there's two chapters I could give you Romans eight and first Corinthians 15 like oh. to really hit these. Now, maybe we could get one on first Corinthians 15, too. Who knows? Well, yes. I mean, that is obviously a major, major chapter. And I've written a lot about that because it's the big resurrection chapter. So it gets the full treatment in my book, The Resurrection of the Son of God. And I'm not sure at the moment that I have anything to add to what <laughs> I said there, but you never know. I mean, one of the joys of doing what I'm doing now, I'm uh, on the staff at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford, which is an Anglican seminary, but I'm not actually teaching any full courses and I'm not examining anybody. Um, but I, I hang out, I go to their morning prayer services day by day, I meet with graduate students to discuss their projects, and once a year I do a series of Bible expositions. Okay. And this book grew out of the one that I did for them two years ago, where I decided um, I, I'd done quite a lot of, of big picture things, where, right. like I did one this last year, where I covered the whole of Acts in eight, uh, eight lectures, which was very, very exciting. I like doing that, but... Um, I decided for this one, I would go millimeter by millimeter, word yes. by word, almost syllable by syllable in some cases, um, to, to encourage the students to dig down into the text, particularly, particularly of course, the Greek text, um, because there's all sorts of treasure there when you really dig down and take time to go into it in detail. I love how you do that through this passage. And it reminds me, we use, I'm sure it's something like the process is something you're familiar with, the inductive Bible study method here oh. that was developed by Robert Trena and then further by David Bauer. And um, so we we take that perspective. And I often say, um, I don't know if I got this from one of them, but you have the bird's eye view and then you have the worm's eye view. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> a very technical way that I described that there, of course. But when, when we have this, it, this is a great example, this book of looking in at the very minute details yeah, of these words yeah. and you provide a transliterated text sure. throughout it it's really helpful to and it's i think for pastors it's a great example of what we can do to get into a text and how yeah. we exegete ourselves yeah and and i think uh, certainly when i was first learning about the bible when i was quite young in my, my teens and so on i tended to look at romans in terms of uh, the few key verses all have sinned and come so short of the glory of god uh, there is therefore now no condemnation etc cetera, etc cetera. i say at the beginning of the book you kind of bounce from one to the other leaping over the difficult bits in between and, yeah. and sadly many preachers still do that because there are difficult bits and it's much easier to go well he's basically saying this and then he's basically saying that but of course again and again when you really dig down when you examine the bits in between the big in between the big famous verses then there's all sorts of things going on which will give you a different nuance for those famous verses so so that that's why i lay out these these rules for reading paul about um, look at the beginning and end of the paragraph. Yes. Look at the little joining words, the the buts or the fors or the becauses or the therefores. They will tell you the link between each verse and the next one or each part verse and the next one. And then stand back and see where is this going within the larger context of the Jewish and Greco-Roman worlds of the time? And only when you've done those things, I think, are you ready to say, now, maybe this is where it's going in our world. 
Yes, that is great. Uh, those three, two, and I love how you bring that back chapter after yeah, chapter yeah. in this right. book. And you're really kind of educating us in this process. Okay, you kind of remind us. Let's go back to this. Yeah, now, yeah. You, God certainly one of the things He's done through you is or help people like me understand the importance of the doctrine of the resurrection. I just yeah. fully admit, like I I read you for a couple of years. And I don't think I still got it because I was still caught into this understanding of heaven as a disembodied state. And I I trusted that that was a good state, yep. but it took so long to, to lock in with me. And now I see the kind of the idea of the what we might call the intermediate state, the second – uh, Second Corinthians five eight to be absent bodies present with the Lord as you call we want to not just focus on life after death but life after life after death. Yeah, yeah. I'm you curious <laughs> for you and, and really po pointing to the resurrection of all things, the renewal of creation, yeah. and that's been such an inspiring thing in, in my own life. And you're one of the ones who helped me get that picture. Oh, good, I'm curious good. for you. Oh well, yeah, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> I I'm curious. Did were you, did you ever come to a place of, of having that realization yourself? Were you in a place where you kind of had a platonic view of the of the universe? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, I grew up with that because half the hymns in the hymn book end with uh, a platonic last verse. Um, <laughs> you know, till in the ocean of thy love we lose ourselves in heaven above. I must have sung that lots of times. I was a, a, a choir boy in the local parish church. And lots of other hymns, which may have many good things in them, but when they get to the last verse, you can tell that the writer is really thinking all of this is simply preparation for when we go upstairs uh, and and when our souls arrive um, in, in God's house or whatever you're going to call it. And p people use the idea of the New Jerusalem as the Jerusalem above, as though that's where we're going completely forgetting that in Revelation, as you know, the New Jerusalem is what comes down from yes. heaven to earth, not not the other way around. And uh, the, where, when I'm explaining it to people now, I say, look at the strap line in Revelation 21.3. It's not the dwelling of humans is with God. It's the dwelling of God is with humans. And that's it's the whole biblical story is God making a world which he wants to come and share with uh, with us and and live amongst us in, in, in the renewed creation. So for me, um, I think the the major I've been tracking this because I'm supposed to be writing an academic autobiography sooner or later. It's about oh great. Uh, well, yeah, it's a, it's yeah. it's number two or three on the on the list at the moment of because I was quite quite ill last year. I had long COVID and lots mm. of things got put back. So I'm kind of looking at piles of paper on the desk and around the study. <laughs> but sooner or later, and it's one of the things which interests me as a kind of. Looking in the mirror, well, yeah, there is a time when I definitely was very much a Platonist evangelical, like most English evangelicals are, thinking that the main aim is to get people's souls into heaven. How do they do that? Well, they must trust Jesus and then follow him, et cetera, et cetera. And how you nuance that is, of course, the debates about justification and sanctification and so on. But that was the aim. And, and then I think it was when I was first teaching historical Jesus issues mm. in the 1980s when I was in McGill and realized that for a Jew of the first century, the idea of the kingdom of God was not at all about going to heaven. People mm. in the first century Jewish world, and when I first read uh, the Jewish writer Josephus from cover to cover, it suddenly dawned on me Josephus is talking about Jerusalem in the 40s and 50s and 60s and, and Galilee, and there's lots of controversies and lots of things going on. But they're not sitting around in those days discussing how to go to heaven when you die. They're mm. sitting around discussing urgently when is God going to come and do the great thing on earth as in heaven that he's promised he would, for which one of the slogans is the kingdom of God. What will it look like when he does? And who among us is showing already that we are part of God's team for when he does that? that those are the issues that are exercising. So then... When I'm reading the Gospels and trying to lecture on them in the in the late 1980s in, in Montreal, uh, I'm realizing Jesus doesn't come along and say, um, you can forget all that stuff about th that's all far too this worldly. I've come to tell you about a platonic heaven. You know, there's many, many Christians who who think that, that, oh, well, the Old Testament is this worldly, but then Jesus comes to teach us about heaven. And that's because they misread Matthew's gospel, which says the kingdom of heaven, where the other gospels say kingdom of God. 
Right. And Matthew does not mean the kingdom has a place called heaven where you go when you die. But most of us, you know, as a good young Christian reading the New Testament, you start with Matthew and you've got all the heaven stuff coming at you from the liturgies and prayers and, 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 and hymns in the tradition. So you assume that's what it means without then thinking, hang on, how does that sit with the Old Testament? So mm. for me, the continuity between the great Jewish vision of the Old Testament and what Jesus, because Jesus isn't saying no to the kingdom of God on earth as in heaven. He's saying yes to that, but then he's redefining it hence the parables. It's coming like seed growing secretly. It's coming like a father who had two sons. That, you know, but but it's the, it's the kingdom on earth as in heaven that's coming. And so for me, that was the beginning. Then I think in the, in the 90s, I started uh, to, to get really interested in, well, hang on, what is the resurrection all about? It, it, it isn't just you know, a pat on the back because Jesus did the job of going to die for our sins. Um, and it isn't that, well, he got raised so that he could then go to heaven and then we'll go there and join him. That that doesn't make any sense of the narrative at all. And somewhere in the mid-90s, I had to do a lecture um, uh, at Spurgeon's College in South London, oh, yeah. where, cur curiously, my brother um, has subsequently been teaching. And the, the, the lecture had a, a name, the lecture, I can't remember what it was, but it had to be about something to do with eschatology and, and God's ultimate future. And I decided to do it on new heavens and new earth as a way of working out what I thought I thought about all that. And that was the beginning of the journey, which ended up with Surprised by Hope, which you will know. So, I mean, it, it, it's a long story, but no, on, the way, on the way, all sorts of things have come out of that, particularly the affirmation of the, of the arts, uh, yes. of the role of the Christian artist or musician to anticipate in the present the sense of new creation. And I've had a lot of artists and musicians come and thank me for articulating this vision of the new creation and showing where they and their work belong within that. Anyway, I could go on about that. Oh, I love it. And, and I think <laughs> I see that energy coming through in yep. this book as well. Not that it wasn't present, I mean, in the other works that you've done, mm -hmm. but it, it certainly people can see these consistent themes, particularly the last 10 or 15 years yeah. in yeah. your writings. And I love it. I love it. But I love seeing it also applied very specifically and exegetically in this in this recent book and yeah. one of the things that you do is you you make sure to set the context and you you see some of these themes coming through and i just i love it like the just the, in the general thought that we're not saved from the world but we're really in light of what you just said saved for the, the world, world. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and and that's a big part of what's happening in romans as a whole so give us yeah, a little yeah. bit of that picture before we get specifically in to romans 8 like what is what is the kind of book as a whole context yeah well um part of the deal here is the biblical view of what humans are made for and i realized when i was writing my little book well, it's not so little on the cross the day the revolution began yes that so much christian thought has moralized our anthropology. In other words, it has read the story of the creation and fall of humans as though the main thing that God was doing was putting Adam and Eve in the garden and giving them a moral examination, which they then fail. Um, and the moral examination is whether you're fit to go to heaven or not. And, you know, of course, Genesis 1 and 2 doesn't say anything at all about are they fit to go to heaven? It's they have a calling to reflect God's love and wise stewardship into creation. And that's the whole point about the image. And I've said it often enough, you probably heard me say it, that the image is not maybe there's something in us which corresponds to something similar in God. That's that's not what the image is about at all. The image is the idea of the angled mirror, and it comes from the fact that creation is a temple. It's a heaven and earth space. And uh, in the ancient world, a temple is a heaven and earth building with an image at its heart so that the God's presence can be reflected into the world and so that the worship of the devotees can be reflected back to God. So uh, obviously the Jerusalem temple doesn't have an image because only a living, breathing human being would do. So kings and priests get to go into the temple, but um, you know how that one goes. So when I talk about the angled mirror, I'm thinking in terms of God's love being reflected out into the world through wise obedient, humble human beings, not arrogant, domineering human beings, please, but because it's God's overflowing love, they must reflect that overflowing love. But at the same time, they are there to reflect the, the praises and the laments 
of the present creation back to God. And it's interesting, in, in Romans 8, you've got all of that. You've got the sense of glorification, which is about stewardship, which is about uh, it's Psalm 8. What are humans that you are mindful of them? You've made them little lower than the angels yes. to crown them with glory and honor. I, I had a, a student when I was at, at um, uh, St. Andrews called uh, Haley Gorenson, who then got married. She's now Haley Gorenson Jacob. And her book, Conformed to the Image of the Sun, really did some groundbreaking work on this about ooh, um, six or eight years ago. And uh, I've I've been able, gratefully, and I acknowledge it in the book, as you'll have seen, I've been able to stand on her shoulders and say, how did the rest of us miss that before? But the glorification there is the vocation of human beings to reflect God's love and care into the world. But because the world is still a mess, that also means reflecting the lament as well as mm -hmm. the praises of the world back to God. And there's a lot of lament at the heart of Romans 8. And so I see this in terms of the vocation to be the royal priesthood. And so the centerpiece of Romans of Romans 8, verses 12 to 30, is not about salvation. Salvation is the outer parameters, as it were, of the chapter. But the centerpiece is about vocation. We are debtors, um, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, but yes. to God, to be the God reflectors in the world conformed to the image of the sun. And then when you stand back and see that in the context of Romans as a whole, it makes so much sense. The failure of humans at the beginning of Romans is not just that they break moral laws, they do, but the point is the failure of worship and hence the failure of stewardship and of ju doing justice in the world. And that by the end, that is put right in the great vision of the church, which you have in Romans 15. So um, that that's that too, along with the temple theme, the image theme has become enormously important to me over the last 20 years or so. I love, and I I hadn't thought about it before. I think it's true that student of yours, um, yeah. that this influ influence of assurance that that's that's a key idea. What comes through in uh, assurance of ultimate salvation of being this reflect a uh, uh, slanted mirror in in the world. That's really helpful. And and I I can't help but think like as we get into this, like even just the very first word of Romans 8 is this kind of pivoting word, this connective trying to push us back to something else. And I know you can have a whole nother 200 pages just on Romans 7, and there's oh, yeah. plenty of debate there, of course. But, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I mean, tell us about, expand that connective for us between 7 and 8. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the, notoriously, <clears throat> starting the um, the chapter with the word therefore in English, it's actually the second wor word in Greek, because that's how the word ara works. It comes second in a sentence. Uden ara nun katakrima. There is therefore now no condemnation. But what sense does that make? Because chapter seven has just ended by saying, wretched man that I am, who will deliver right. me from this, um, this body of death? And then he says, thanks be to God through Jesus. And then he says, so I have my, myself served the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, the law of sin. You might have thought, so there we are. It's a mess and we're a mess but the way that the therefore works is that he puts it up front and then you have the because 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 and i use silly illustrations in the book like saying um here's my car unfortunately the tires are all slashed to ribbons unfortunately the battery is flat unfortunately the windscreen's broken therefore i have no trouble getting to my destination because here is this the guy with the new tires here's the person who's going to charge up the battery and here comes the, the person who's going to put give me a new windscreen so the because to begin with looks ridiculous but then it's um the, sorry the therefore looks ridiculous but then when you say because because but and the because basically is the work of uh, the Messiah and the Spirit has done what the Torah could not do. And then when I stand back from Romans 7, this is something again, which I should have seen years ago, um, and which I'm now factoring in, and this is the first time I've actually written that out, that the towards the end of Romans 7, Paul talks about um, that we we have become captive. Um, and he uses a, a Greek word, eikmelotid zonta, that the law has, has made me a prisoner of war. But um, mm -hmm. one of the things I do as a, as, a, as a habit is that I read the Old Testament in either Hebrew or Greek, and I alternate between the two. But if you read the Old Testament in Greek, the Septuagint, which was the Bible of the early church, the word eikmelotidzo and its cognates, 
regularly refer to exile. And mm -hmm. when I saw that, of course, you will know that exile has been a major important theme in my thinking and writing about the about biblical theology. But then, of course, Romans 7 is telling the whole Deuteronomic story of Israel. It's telling from uh, when the Torah arrived and uh, Torah promises life, but actually it effectively gives death because the people to whom Torah is given are themselves fallen children of fallen Adam. And here's the tension of the whole Old Testament reflected dramatically in Romans 7, that God, knowing perfectly well that the human race is in a mess, calls a member of the human race, i.e. Abraham, to start the rescue project, mm -hmm. knowing that he and his people are themselves going to need rescuing. And so the Pentateuch runs from the stories of Adam and Abraham through to the end of Deuteronomy, where you get precisely the warning that if you don't obey Torah, you're going to exile. And only mm. when you've gone into exile, then at a future stage, Deuteronomy 30, will God rescue you and renew your heart and so on and bring you back and do the new thing that he's promised. But then Deuteronomy 32, the great song of Moses, one of Paul's favorite passages in the whole Old Testament, um, that has the dire warnings again. And it's as though Paul has collapsed the whole of that Pentateuchal narrative into Romans 7. No wonder it's so dense, because he's also alluding to the Aristotelian tradition of, of the person with weak will, etc. And it's a very, very clever piece of writing. But then on that basis, the Romans 8 is then able to take off and say, we are now the Deuteronomy 30 people, which is why he then quotes Deuteronomy 30 in chapter 10, which is the equivalent passage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's it's a brilliant piece of of sketching the story of Israel as Paul's own story, because he never wants to say them, they. Um, uh, it, that that would be a way of distancing himself from the whole Jewish tradition. And Paul does not want to do that. So he says, I this, I that. And because he he's he's felt the tension of it, the theological tension of it in himself. So um that that is the launching pad for chapter eight being the renewal of the covenant, as in Deuteronomy 30, which is picked up in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, precisely the post-exilic promises of the ways in which God is going to renew Israel, rebuild the temple, and ultimately renew the whole creation. So the creation renewal passage in Romans 8 goes very closely with passages like Isaiah 55, where the covenant has been renewed through the death of the servant, Isaiah 53 and 54, so that now creation is renewed, Isaiah 55. Paul is absolutely tracking with that whole uh, uh, whole Old Testament sequence. So then here you take that I to be the people of Israel. Some some might even say, have said Adam, they come up with all kinds of things to describe this, but as the people of Israel. And I, I think it's interesting, this research that you bring up lately about the idea of captives reminds me too of Scott Hafen's work on Second Corinthians yeah, yeah. and the, the thought of being, we are you know, often mistranslated that we are cap, we are taken as captives yeah, of yeah, the yeah. ones who are led in triumphal procession, kind of leading to this bigger picture as well. Yes, yes. Uh, Scott was a colleague of mine in, in St. Andrews and a dear friend, and uh, and happily his wife's a good friend of my wife as well. And Scott and I have had this discussion many times, like we've had certain other discussions many times. And I think I probably agree with him, but I would have to go back and think, now, wait a minute, what was how, how did the argument run <laughs> last time we had it? <laughs> but, 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 I mean, f for me... Of course, Adam is there in Romans 7 as well, because Adam is there all through Romans 1, 1 to 8, sure. um, but because the whole thing is about the human project, God's project for his image-bearing humans going wrong because Adam messes up. But then, as we know in Genesis, the promises to Abraham recapitulate the commands to Adam. Be fruitful right. and multiply comes out as I will make you fruitful and multiply you exceedingly. And that's one of the key insights, I think, for the whole uh, the whole of the Jewish tradition, actually, as some some of the rabbis pick that up very clearly. Um, uh, and and it's, it's absolutely crucial for Paul in Romans. Romans 4, he's yes, shown yeah. how what God has done in Jesus means that the promises to Abraham are now fulfilled right, for right. the world. That means he can stand back and say, so Adam, Messiah, there we are, we have the complete picture. And then Romans 6 through 8 is filling in the, the story, which he's sketched in the briefest of terms in Romans 5, 12 to 21. I mean, Paul, Paul's such a brilliant writer, it's quite extraordinary intellectual feat, the way he's pulled it all together.
Oh, I love it. And I just love that that can regular theme that you keep bringing on. It's a way that this is an example of the new covenant and the way that pushes through. And it and interesting, the first four verses you mentioned to the focus on the cross. And a lot of people, uh, because it could because you've said things dramatically about justification, and that doesn't always sit well with people, you do make it very clear here that this is one of the clearest passages speaking to a penal view of the, uh, the substitutionary uh, nature of the atonement. So tell us Absolutely. about that. Well, um, it's funny because after my book on uh, the day the revolution began came out, some people said, ah, there it is, N.T. Wright has denied penal substitution, which is precisely what I don't do in that book. Right. What I do is to show that there are that the phrase penal substitution can be taken a number of different ways, depending on what larger narrative you're putting it in. If you put it into a narrative which says that the whole point of the Bible is to get people's souls into heaven and that humans mess up uh, because there's a moral law which they've broken, um, then you will end up having a view of penal substitution, which, as as I say in that other book, uh, God so hated the world that he killed his son, which is not what John 3.16 says. Now, some people have objected that that's a caricature, but others have come back to my defense and said, no, that is what a lot of young people in our churches think that they've heard when they've heard a sermon on the cross. They think, oh, God is this fearsome bully who's got a big stick and he was determined to kill somebody. Fortunately, somebody got in the way. It happened to be his own innocent son. So somehow mm -hmm. that makes it all right. And then a lot of people think, hang on, uh, th this this makes no sense at all. Uh, and and if you say, oh, well, it's because God loved us, some, sadly, some young people think, oh, dear, I know this story, the man with the big stick who says he loves you, and, and yet he comes and beats you. Sadly, many young people have suffered from such horrible um, parenting or, or, or guardianship or whatever it is. So uh, I'm, I'm sort of saying that's the wrong way to do it. What we have here in Romans 8, 1 to 4 is definitely penal. There is no condemnation because God condemned sin in the flesh of Christ. That is definitely penal, and it's definitely substitutionary. Right. Jesus' death means that we do not suffer that same death. That, that's If that isn't substitutionary, I don't know what is. But it's very interesting that the context of that is not that old moral equation of moralizing our anthropology so that the main thing is that we've broken the moral law so god has to punish somebody etc etc the the point is the failure of vocation and then israel's failure of vocation but god using that this is uh, the genius of romans 7 as the way of drawing sin which mm -hmm. is personified here as almost as though it means satan or the devil or the power of evil or yes, something drawing sin onto one place the people of Israel, and then drawing it from the people of Israel onto the Messiah himself, so that with the death of Jesus, sin itself is condemned. And, you know, people can say, well, it doesn't look as though sin is condemned because I still sin and people around me still sin. But the New Testament message is very clear that God has in the cross disarmed the principalities and powers colossians 2 god has overcome he's won the victory the whole of the book of revelation is about that the lion the lamb of the lion of judah the lamb has conquered by by his blood and has won the victory and we now have to live out of that victory as it were but the point is he condemned sin in the flesh of jesus that's the most nuanced that paul ever says it he doesn't say oh god punished jesus and he he can of course it's the same event it's right, still right. horrible bloody brutal lynching of an innocent young uh, jewish uh, kingdom of god person but the theological analysis uh, is all there's all the difference in the world instead of god just beating up on jesus because he wants to beat up on somebody this is god's plan god's israel shaped plan for dealing with the dark power of evil itself that that's that's a hard thing to get your mind around especially yeah. if you've been brought up and i i was speaking um on good friday in a church in london a few years ago and they'd asked me to come and do, I think, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter morning. And I'm very glad to do that. But I took quite some time to walk them through how the Old Testament narrative works to get to this point. And several members of the congregation, it's a good evangelical church in London, several members of the congregation said that was very interesting because we don't normally hear all that Old Testament background. And right. I was thinking, without that, 
you're bound to produce a caricature. And I really worry that many Christians today are saying, in effect, oh, the Old Testament's too difficult and it's sort of remote from us, etc. Let's just stick with the New Testament. But of Unhitch course, ourselves from it. Well, exactly. Uh, so the, uh, the New Testament itself tells you on every page, you will only understand this if you understand the Old Testament as the great story which is, has got us here. Yes. And you make the clarification, too, that what we're thinking about thinking of here in this passage of what happens with sin, it's not just sins, but sin. And you capitalize yeah, sin yeah. In, throughout the, your exegesis of this. Yeah, yeah. Th th that's right. And I'm following there are many scholars who've written about this, that in Romans, uh, perhaps in Romans 6 as well, but certainly in Romans 7 and 8, it is as though Paul is retelling the story of the snake in the garden, and he doesn't want to dignify it by calling it the Satan, but so he's just calling it sin and seeing it as, as a quasi-personal power, which I think is actually true to how the New Testament as a whole sees the dark force that lies behind evil. It's basically destructive. It's anti-creation. It's anti-covenant. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's but it's very sneaky and very powerful, and it creeps in and it still grabs us, etc. But God has defeated it in and through Jesus. And Amen. That's, mm -hmm. that's the sigh of relief. Amen. Oh, I love it. I, I want. I'm interested too. Um, when uh, just jumping ahead a little bit, which is kind of hard because I'm I'm tempted to come back. But when you get to twelve to 17 you talk about this key verse that I've often understood in 15 and 16 and thinking about the way the grammar works that passage uh you give two options and this is on page 104 of your book yeah, but you okay. say like one of the options is um we have received the spirit of sonship in whom we call abba father period the spirit bears witness with our spirit or the second option we have received the spirit of sonship period when we call Abba, comma, Father, comma, the Spirit is bearing witness with our spirit. Now, there, there's a different emphasis here that I think is really important. I'd love for you to unfold that for us. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think in a sense, Paul wants to say both, and I think I say that in 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 this in this passage in the book. Um, uh, you see, I, I, yes, in my translation, I've tried to get the best of both worlds by rendering it, you receive the spirit of sonship in whom we call yes. out Abba Father. And when that happens, it is the spirit itself giving supporting witness. Um, as so often, Paul has scrunched different meanings together. He wants to say, I'll just read what I said here. He wants to say both that the cry of Abba Father is the sure sign that we've received the spirit of sonship when we are, are aware that God is our father and that is loving us as a father and that we can talk to him as father that that can only happen if the spirit has done that in our hearts because people without the spirit think of the word god and they think of either a faceless bureaucrat or a dangerous tyrant or an absentee landlord or whatever not usually as uh, a generous, a loving father. Um, but then Paul also wants to say that this is the sign, and, and this is a really interesting thing, and Paul doesn't develop this in the way that we might like him to, that the Spirit is at work with our spirit. Paul yes, talks yes. about the human spirit, and actually much of the Christian tradition has ignored that and has gone with the word soul, which we get from Plato. Obviously, the word soul, psuche, does occur in the right. New Testament, but not with the Platonic meaning. So Christians have thought that the soul is the key thing. But for Paul, it's our spirit which is bonded with the Holy Spirit. Paul discusses this a bit in First Corinthians as well. And I think this is really important because of the immediately preceding argument as well, where it's the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, who functions as the bridge between our present life and the ultimate resurrection life. So that if somebody says, so who am I going to be between my bodily death and my bodily resurrection? The best answer that I can give from Paul is actually that if the Spirit has indwelt you in this life, the Spirit then, after your physical death, isn't going to say, well, that was an interesting experiment which we now just let drop. The Spirit, as the third member of the Trinity, is holding on to our Spirit, looking after us. So you might say that every aspect of our lives in which the Spirit has been at work and has been shaping us, that is what's going to be remaining of us, as it were, in the interim between death and resurrection. So that then when the Spirit raises us from the dead, 
it's all that the spirit has already done in us which will become the person that that, that we will become so i think that, that that's that's really where paul is going with this because he's preparing us in these verses 15 following isn't it for what he's then going to say in in 18 and following it, yes. it is i appreciate it's complicated if any of your viewers or listeners are anxious about this um just take it take it steadily take it word by word line by line and i think you'll see it'll work out yeah, it's so much it's so much better if we do that as opposed to just say, well, sure. that's hard. You know, I don't know. don't know quite what to do there. But I appreciate the way you walk us through this in this book. And you just going back a little bit there when you're talking about like the spirit being with us in that I'll just say intermediate state yeah. in this middle yeah. place, a life after death. Um, then there's this reality that this and sometimes when I say this, you know, I. I People think I'm crazy because they've not heard it. Like I'll say, like, look, we're you sing if you sing the glory of Patri, you sing world without end. We say in the Apostles' Creed, from thence he will come to judge the quick and the dead. These type we believe in the resurrection of the body. That this whatever this force is, this entity that makes us up, that's one with the spirit, comes back to the body. Now, yeah. when I say that, people say, you're just making this up. This sounds more like a movie, Andy. I don't know what you're saying, but I think I think that it's so much better. It's yeah, so much yeah. better than than, a, than the alternative view. Of course, yes. And I mean, first century Jews who believed in the resurrection of the body, that's the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, they had to develop ways of talking about the intermediate state. And you see it in Acts 23, when Paul says this whole business is about resurrection. And they say, ah, oh, well, maybe a spirit or an angel spoke to him. And it's as though they have these these are not precise terms for them. These are loose ways of saying that in between death and resurrection, people are still around in God's space. So maybe they're in, around as a spirit or as an angel, but then they will be raised later on. Um, and uh, other examples of that as well. Um, in other words, if you believe in resurrection, you have to have some theory of who you are or where you are or what you are in between the one and the other. So as you say, life after death rather than life after life after death. And I think we don't give enough attention to that. And I think specifically, we haven't, uh, I haven't read any theologians trying to work out what it means to say that after our death, it isn't so much that we still have the spirit, but that the spirit still has us. Um, mm -hmm. And that in the mystery of the Trinity, Paul says in, in uh, Colossians, your life is hidden with the Messiah in God. And I think that's perhaps as close as you can get. Um, you have died, your life is hidden with the Messiah in God. And when the Messiah, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. And so at the moment, somebody who has died, and, and he's talking realized eschatology there, he's saying you've died already in baptism. So we are already, in a sense, in a different kind of intermediate state. Um, and as you say, people uh, get puzzled and think this is a bit too much like a movie. The answer is, we've been so used to the old movie for so long Hello. Um, about the dying and going to heaven yeah. thing. That, that getting that out of our heads and getting the biblical story in instead is is hard work. It really is. Well, it's interesting to me too how often movies portray an idea of a resurrection. Like, yeah. like this is something that comes out. It's like I think there's something within the natural theology that is pointing us to this. That that authors want to see something happen in the body as yep. we kind of see like with this this neck the next section that we just left and we think about uh 18 on yeah, about yeah. the liberation of yeah. all creation i think that that's something that's put inside of us that we're all longing for that and yeah. i love the, the way that you say it so often um just a kind of the point of easter is that like what happens what we celebrate is that god's going to do this for all of creation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And this is an insight, of course, which the Eastern Orthodox churches, the Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Egyptian, uh, Coptic Orthodox, etc., they have always emphasized that. And I was once talking to a, a Greek Orthodox archbishop um, uh, in uh, who was visiting the Lambeth Conference in 2008, and I was eager to, to ask him some questions about his theology. And I kept trying to press him on the meaning of the cross, the crucifixion, because the Orthodox haven't tended to emphasize that. And eventually he said, the point of the cross is it's the prelude to the resurrection. Everything mm. had to come back to that. And, and I agree, of course, the cross is the prelude to the resurrection, but we didn't get any further with that conversation. But it's something that Western theology has, has screened right out. And I think it's because of the turn to Plato. 
and really ever since i don't know augustine or before augustine this this sense of a soul needing to get to heaven and then of course particularly in the high middle ages with thomas aquinas and the beatific vision and really um, there are ways for Aquinas where you can hold together the beatific vision with the ultimate resurrection, but that's difficult. And Aquinas scholars will tell you it's difficult. And and Dante, who followed Aquinas and wrote his great poem, the the, the Divine Comedy, um, Dante found it difficult as well because the beatific vision seems to be the be all and end all. And then, oh, by the way, there is also the resurrection, and that'll be even better. But but it's kind of not integrated. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Uh, and so then the renewal of all creation um and and until very recently many scholars reading romans 8 18 through 30 would say when paul says all creation he presumably just means human beings because mm-hmm. he can't possibly have this cross stuff of grass and trees and flowers and cows and and whales and whatever um, and <laughs> hap- happily we've now swung right away from that i think and most theologians in exegesis i think would now say no when paul says crisis creation he means creation and that this is the fulfillment of what he says in romans 4 that god's promise to abraham was that he would inherit the world and somebody asked me about this after the lecture that i gave in london last night um that that the the the, the, the whole point um and this is in relation to the present situation in the middle east mm. that uh christians have uh, have not realized that in psalm 2 already the single land promised to Abraham is enlarged to include the whole world. God says to Abraham, I'll give you this land. God says to the Messiah in Psalm 2, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the world for your possession. New Testament picks up exactly that, which is why you have a Gentile mission, which is why you have the renewal of all creation. This is the fulfillment so that, as I've said often enough, read my lips, the whole world is now God's holy land. And, Amen. you know, if we'd realized that three or 400 years ago, all sorts of nonsense that is currently mm. going on would not be going on. No doubt mm. there would be other forms of nonsense, but not the one we currently have. Do you think, thinking of like the conflict, and we're recording this on November 10th, the conflict in the Middle East, There, with that in mind, and thinking with uh, in re- the realms of eschatology that there is a sense that Israel still has some significance geographically um or is or is that, is that do we no. just need to keep on pointing back it's the whole of creation um paul says in second corinthians all the promises of god find their yes in the messiah jesus any attempt to say ah oh, but there are three or four other promises which aren't yet fulfilled in Jesus and so God is reserving them for some future thing this is basically a 19th century mistake of exegesis it came in through the Plymouth Brethren movement through the dispensationalism and obviously the different kinds of dispensationalism but an attempt to find an eschatology which would get round the rather embarrassing problem that when Jesus came, most of his fellow countrymen didn't believe. Now, the Gospels address that problem, but the way the dispensationalists did it was to say, well, okay, that meant that some of the key promises about the land and so on were put on hold, and they're waiting for a future date. And guess what? That future date was 1947, when the United Mm -hmm. Nations voted to say that um, the Jewish people could go and and establish a a homeland once again. Now, um, let me make it very clear that I have every total sympathy for the need of the Jewish people, particularly after centuries of pogroms and persecutions Mm -hmm. and and being kicked out of whole countries and so on, and then particularly reaching its climax in the Nazi Holocaust, of course. Uh, I have every sympathy with saying they have to have a place where they are secure. They have to have a place where they can belong, where they can be themselves. But this has then been pushed in a quite yes. different direction, particularly by what has called itself Christian Zionism, which I see as a, a basically a contradiction in terms. Because for a Christian, Jesus is Lord of the whole world. The whole world is now God's holy land. And the way the New Testament works is not to say, oh, well, there's this little bit which is still special, and, and that that's kind of reserved for the Jews at some future date. But no, the, the church is not simply Jews over there waiting for something else and then gentile christians over there that that's a very common mistake which many people make at the moment thinking to be 
um, making sure that they're, as it were, making room for the Jewish people, faced with the rising tide of anti-Semitism. We've got it in the UK at the moment. As you say, we're recording on November the 10th, uh, this coming weekend in London, there's going to be um, a huge uh, march of pro-Palestinian sympathizers. And there's a great political debate whether that should even be allowed, because it may well be, they may well, some of them be bent on making trouble. But, and the Jewish community in my country are really frightened at the moment. And I have every sympathy for them. If If I was in the job I was doing once before, I would want to uh, link arms with the local rabbi and walk down the street and say, not in our name, thank you very much. Mm. So um, make it very clear. Yes, you are. It's 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 not about um, casual support for one side or the other. At the same time, the indiscriminate bombing of civilians, etc., sure. um, mm -hmm. seems to me one of the definitions of a war crime. Um, and so we there's all sorts of stuff going on. And the, this is why, <laughs> back to Romans 8, the plea for lament is so important yes. and and the 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 call to the church to be the people of lament at the place where the world is in pain so that the holy spirit may be lamenting right there and so that the father and the spirit will be sharing that cruciform lament at the heart of the world's pain and that says paul is how god is bringing the new world to birth. So our prayer, our lament, is, is not just we're looking on from a distance and saying, oh dear, it's all rather horrible, but we are actually being used in God's purposes to be the vessels and vehicles of the prayer through which he will do the good new things that he wants to do. So huge yeah. topic, my goodness. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much for taking time to go into the contemporary situation as well. <laughs> well and I well. think we hear it, like we hear you loud and clear that you, that of the way you want to recognize Israel and it, kind of like in our contemporary situation, but sure. not to allow that to come back and influence the way we exegete these passages. Yeah. And then the role of lament, I think even for this time in light of what's happening globally and the the yeah. pains yeah. that yeah. we feel in this world you know a lot of times um verse 26 is yeah. taken taken to be and, and i and i've applied it this way for sure like god's helping me pray at this moment yeah. but yeah. you yeah. bring yeah. it up and, and and i'd love for you to say a little bit more about how lament comes with this like the spirit yeah. helps us when we intercede on our behalf yes. even when we don't know what to pray groaning yes. too deep for words yeah, uh, which is an extraordinary passage. Paul is saying that the third person of the Trinity can't find the words to say how bad it is, <laughs> you know, uh, which I see that as the pneumatological equivalent of the cry of dereliction from the cross when Jesus wow. shouts, my God, my God, why did you abandon me? It's as though the spirit at the heart of the church, at the heart of the pain of the world, the spirit is saying, this is absolutely terrible. And and the word groaning picks up the image from Exodus chapter 2 of the children of Israel in Egypt groaning under slavery. Um, and, and God hears. So in this passage too, God hears. Yes. He knows what is the mind of the Spirit. And Paul has is there echoing Psalm 44, which he echoes more explicitly later in the chapter, for, for your sake we are being killed all day long, etc. And Psalm 44 is one of those great laments which says, Lord, um, if we had been misbehaving, if we've been getting stuff wrong, then we could understand the mess we're in. But we haven't. We have not gone false on you. We've not played false to the covenant. So what are you doing about it? Come on. It's a mess. Rise up and help us. And so um, and, and it's 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 God as the searcher of the hearts is the key there that links with Psalm 44. Mm -hmm. um, and so Paul's vision of God, the heart searcher, the spirit, the one who is groaning within us, at the heart of the pain of the world, so that through God's own incarnated prayer, the world may be healed. And that that's why, as, as you say, it's easy to detach verses 26 and 27 and think that for some reason, at the climax of one of his greatest chapters, Paul has just dropped in two little verses on, oh, by the way, prayer is a bit difficult, but the Spirit helps us. I mean, of course, that's true, but it's organically part of the whole argument of the whole chapter. Indeed, it's the climax of the whole Amen. chapter. Wow. The, the, so the, 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 the pneumatological incarnational theme, um, which is called and is calling us to be the royal priesthood and here the priesthood laying before 
the love of God, the pain of the world in which we live. Mm. And then that ties right. I love the way what you do with um, Romans eight twenty eight. Even though you admit yeah. at the very beginning of that chapter, you're like it would be, you know, I liked how I read this verse sixty years ago. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like what this means. Well, and yeah, go go uh, ahead. Uh, before I know uh, all things work together, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, this is the thing that it's a verse everybody knows. All things work together for good for those who love God, which can easily collapse into a sort of stoic view of providence that. You know, the, 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 it'll all work out somehow, and right. just, just just relax. God's in control, or or something. But um, that that's not what he's saying at all. And and here again, I do want to mention um, Haley Jacob, and also my dear friends Brian Walsh and Sylvia Kiesmat, whose book Romans Disarmed has a reading which really helped me with this. But when faced with what those two authors were saying, I went back and reread the Greek text. I'm thinking, how did I manage? to avoid what the Greek text actually says, because the, the Greek word synergy means to work yeah. with. Um, and, synergy. And takes, synergy. Yeah, yeah. Syner exactly, synergy. And of course, um, theologians have been so worried about synergism, yes. as though it means that we're helping God in the process of our own salvation. This is not about salvation. It's about vocation. It's mm. about the way in which God is calling humans to be his partners in the in the, the work that he's doing in the world right now. You find exactly the same at the beginning of 2 Corinthians 6, working together with him, therefore, we beseech you not to accept the grace of God in vain. And it's the, the regular word that Paul uses for his co-workers, his fellow workers is synergoi. So the answer is that God, and God is the subject of the sentence, not all things, that God is at work for good with those who love him. And the phrase those who love him comes up at the front of the verse in the Greek. It's hard mm. to do that in English because those who love him is referring back to the scenario he's just painted in verses 26 and 27 cross reference back to chapter 5 verse 5 where the the love of god is poured into our hearts through the spirit who dwells in us so now he's described the work of the spirit within us in terms of this groaning in prayer and the father hearing and knowing that those are the people who are loving god in precisely that process of laying before the loving father the pain of the world and paul is saying that uh, God is working all things for good through that process. Right. This is this is then a matter of the vocation, the Christ-shaped vocation, verse 29, which results in the Israel-shaped vocation, verse 30, because those he justified, them he also glorified, picks up exactly the Greek words in Isaiah 45, um, when in the Lord, all the all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall be glorified. And it's the same words, dikai thesontai kai, um, doxas thesontai. And it's as though Paul is saying, this is how, through that prayer and through being shaped in and with the Messiah, who is Israel in person, as it were, you are now bearing and sharing the vocation of Israel to be the servant people for the sake of the world. And then that runs straight into the last paragraph, verses 31 to 39. Oh, uh, yeah, that is so great. The idea of not just salvation, but vocation, vocation. Yeah, being an yeah. emphasis here. And um, our common friend, my former teacher, Ben Witherington, he yeah. he highlights in, in his comment, his urban's commentary, how in that verse, um, and, and I saw you, you, highlight, you note it as well, that the it doesn't say necessarily those um, called according to his purpose, that his isn't actually there. Oh, yeah. So he kind of takes that in and he um, takes a reading from uh, mentions Chrysostom and a few others who talk about, but but the purpose, hey, think about how that idea of purpose might even fit in with the idea of vocation still. Now yeah. it is his purpose. Yeah, I, I'm not absolutely. saying it's not his, but it is interesting that that word's yeah. not there. Yeah. 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 That's okay. right. Well, one of the, one of the delights and frustrations of, of of doing this book, and indeed one or two others that I've been doing around the same time, uh, somebody said to me, the great thing about being retired is you don't have to worry about footnotes anymore. Now, um, <laughs> I, I have written one or two books in retirement, which have got a lot of footnotes, my commentary on Galatians being an, an example. But I, I deliberately set out not to write another book full of footnotes. I've done plenty of those. You have. So I thought uh, there's one or two, uh, which were kind of necessary notes. But certainly Ben Witherington's work has been, uh, well, Ben and I are old friends, um, um, so he, he's been really helpful to me, and I hope I've been some small help to him. But um, 
so yes, there's all sorts of ways one could go into the patristic exegesis and so on. And and yes, noting called according to God's purpose, to the purpose, to purpose. Yeah, um, yeah. And the purpose then is the whole purpose why humans were made, the whole purpose why Israel was called, the whole purpose why the servant was called in Isaiah 40 to 55. And that's all coming at us through Jesus by the Spirit turning into our vocation as Spirit-led Christians. I want to get to verse 29 in just a second, but I can't help but highlight, you know, I know you're old friends with them, but yeah. I'm sure people have said this before uh, when he says in his commentary, when right is wrong and he goes after you for a few pages. So uh, I don't know what you could say with Witherington in the same way that could get him. But it, it... <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever tried to make a crit of Ben. And I think he and I have had many discussions over the years. And uh, of course, Ben is a particular kind of Methodist. I'm a particular kind of Anglican. So we're kind of cousins, you know, yes, the yes. Methodist churches, you know, um, John Wesley said, I live and die a member of the Church of England and I advise all of you to do the same. Um, and sadly, not all his followers took that seriously. But um, yes, that's right. But, so, so I, I don't think the I don't think the disagreements are massive. And I yeah. suspect that we are both in our different ways working towards what might turn out to be convergence. And it's one of the great things I found again and again is uh, as you turn a corner in your reading of scripture and see a whole vista of something which you hadn't factored in before, you realize. This actually puts you on the same page as somebody whose work you hadn't quite understood before. And that that's that's always really encouraging when that happens. It, so, so this idea of predestination that comes in 29, it's it's, it's interesting. You, you say that it's not necessarily we're not thinking of this just as salvation, but yeah. maybe is it again that vocation theme that yeah. comes through? It's the same the same in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, uh, that, that we, we are chosen that we might live and work to his praise and glory. We are chosen that we should be the people through whom God reveals his glory in the world. Um, Ephesians 1 uh, doesn't actually say you are predestined in the Calvinist sense. And and uh, the same with Romans 8, uh, 29 and, and 30, and preparing the way, of course, for some similar predestinarian language in chapter 9, <clears throat> which is about sure. the vocation of Israel. Paul is retelling the story of Israel. Israel was called for a particular purpose. The purpose had to do with getting the Adam purpose back on track. But Paul has been talking about the Adam purpose throughout Romans 1 to 8. There's all the echoes of Adam in Romans 1, echoes of Adam in Romans 3, um, Adam very explicitly in Romans 5, and 5 to 8 makes a complete circle, Adam, Adam. Um, so it's all about what God always intended humans to be doing in and for his world. You know, God is the power-sharing God. God didn't make a world with humans just as creatures to be set in examination so that they might then go to heaven. Humans are part of the deal of how God wanted his world to work. And the Christological focus of verse 29 makes this clear. The reason why God made the world with humans as his image bearers in that way was because the triune God always intended to come in the second person to become human himself. Creation is made in order to be a vehicle for God's appropriate self-revelation. And then the creation of humans in God's image is also the, vo the vessel for the appropriate self-realization, if you like, of the third person of the Trinity. And the older I get, the more I see the Trinitarian uh, groundwork, as it were, of Genesis 1 and 2, and the way that that is then retrieved precisely in this sense of purpose. We are called to be genuine humans. I constantly these days I'm cross-referencing Re Revelation chapter 5, where we're not told that uh, we're saved by the work of the Lion who is also the Lamb, so that we can go and sit on a cloud and play harps forever and ever. Right. We're saved by the, the Lion who is also the Lamb, so that we can be the royal priesthood, so okay. that we can be the ones who share God's rule or reign in his new creation. And that begins right now with that vocation to lament and all the other things that go with that, to speak the truth to power and to, to, to call the world to account, as in John 16. So I could go on about this a long time. It's actually, that's what I was lecturing about in London last night, which was quite fun. It's beautiful. Well, if ever there was a fire hose of information on one chapter, it's this book. I'm <laughs> holding it up again, Into the Heart of Romans, a deep dive, a truly deep dive 
into Paul's greatest letter. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for the way you've come thank on you. here and share this with us. It's exciting <laughs> to hear this. I, you know, you have been a gift to the church in the way that you have facilitated the resources that have come from you and 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 poured over them. I just think of all of the ways that people's preaching has been impacted, not just preaching, in the way that we even read the Bible. Oh. I, I just really thank you for the clear well, way you. you've allowed God to use your vocation. Th th thank you very much. I mean, you know, I, I hear the words you say, but I simply sit here at the desk doing the next thing and the next thing and trying to feed my family and stay out of trouble. <laughs> and, and, you know, this this is, uh, it, it, I look at the shelf with lots of books on with my name on and I think, that's funny, how did that happen? I, I've just <laughs> been doing the next task and the next task. But it's it's been fun. You know, I'm now in my mid-70s. God willing, if I live for another fortnight or so, I shall turn 75. And uh, uh, the, the, the last 50 plus years, I've simply had as my main goal to try to understand the Bible better and to make it clear to people. And not all the people that I thought would like it when I did that did in fact like it. Quite a lot of people that I never imagined would like it have liked it. So God moves in mysterious ways, and I'm just happy to do to do what I've been trying to do. <laughs> It's, it's beautiful. It's really been a blessing to me. It's such an honor for me to talk to you because you've had a deep influence on my life. And I know as I was talking to our faculty here, people almost didn't believe me that I was actually going to be having an interview with you. Uh, well, but I'm so, th so thankful for it. And let me... Um, I often end the podcast by asking the same question and the title of my podcast is more to the story and people can find, I can't say just like this, but you can find interviews somewhat like this. If you go to my podcast and uh, YouTube channel, Andy Miller, the third, you can find that, but it's called more the story because I want to go deeper in behind yeah, people's yeah. content. What they're doing also theologically for me, I want to emphasize that there's more than just getting our sins forgiven. There's an opportunity yeah, we have yeah. to participate in this vocation and experience God's sanctifying grace. But at the same time, I love to get more to the story of Tom Wright. I've I've probably, I'm going to fanboy out here. I've probably listened to a couple hundred hours of recordings <laughs> of you through the years. So I think I've heard a lot. But is there more to the story of Tom <laughs> well, Wright than is usually told? Well, well uh, the, the obvious thing to say, and it's the true thing to say, uh, I'm supposed to be writing an academic autobiography, as I said, and I have sometimes semi-seriously suggested that uh, as a running head at the top of each page should be something to the effect, while I was working on this, my dear wife Maggie was looking after the four children as they were all at different schools, and as one of them broke his leg, and as this happened and that happened, and Maggie is the usually unsung heroine of so much that I've done. She has followed me from job to job. We've moved house 18 times in 52 wow. years of marriage, which is more than anyone ought to do. It's just we're quite good at moving house now, but it doesn't make it any nicer as a thing to do. Um, she is, bless her, as we speak now, she is up in Scotland with our oldest son who's helping with the project, where we're building a house, looking out over the Atlantic Ocean, a beautiful view, and mm. she is thinking about the tiles and the curtains and that sort of thing. Um, and this is typical of her. She, you know, here's, here's me, I'm sitting at the desk doing what I do, and she's out there making stuff happen for, with and for the family. And, uh, you know, I can't thank her enough. I mean, it's mm. impossible to thank her. She's been... She's been uh, just a hero, and uh, you know, obviously, I I love her. And I, I tell you what, I got a photograph of her. Well, here show us. Is, yes, yeah. Here, here she is with with with. Uh, oh, with a, this, a this was in a friend's a friend's apartment, <laughs> and and it had a, this enormous tiger on the wall. And somebody <laughs> who was with her said, "Here, Maggie, stand in front of that tiger because because you you are the tiger in this family." And so <laughs> it's it's a great picture of her. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Oh, thank you for that tribute. I think a lot of us are probably really glad to hear about Maggie and all the way good, that she's good. enabled you to be ancestral. Now, also, you, I, I learned too, but ahead of the podcast, you're a trombone player. In your, your <laughs> well, life, right? I, I was. I, I played the trombone through my teens and 20s. Um, I, I, I was very fortunate because when I, I went to my senior school when I was 13, and the 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 boys who it was a boys' school, and the boys who'd been playing trombone in the school orchestra had all just left the previous year, 
and there were three of us who were singing in the choir and the music director came and said to the three of us you can all read music you can all sing in tune um within a few weeks you could be playing trombone um if you agree you can have free use of the instrument and free lessons for the first year what do you think and we all said yeah sounds sounds fun that's great <laughs> so we were stuck in the back row of the of the school orchestra within within weeks of being wow. given trombone uh, lessons and uh, so i i you know i i learned a lot about classical music by sitting in the back row the trombone doesn't have a huge amount to do right when you do it's it's very noticeable but for quite a lot of the time you're counting 30 or 40 bars rest before yes. you come in but that gives you the chance to figure out how the orchestra works and what sort of things the composers do with the woodwind or the timpani or the second violins or whatever and that stayed with me all my life and mm. as you know if you read my stuff there's a lot of music woven yes. in because music is the language I kind of naturally think in. And so I've, uh, but then I also played for fun in jazz bands and that sort of thing, which is some of the most fun stuff you can do is to be oh, man, playing man. jazz or, or indeed a military band. We had a military band at school and marching to and fro, playing that one past stuff. You know, yeah. it's trivial at one level, but my goodness, it's fun. Um, yeah. When, you, when you're with friends and, and out there making music, it's just great. <laughs> it's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It means a lot to me. I hope I get to meet you sometime in person, no, shake your hand, knows? but thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. It's really good to talk. Thank you. Thank you.